For those of you that don't know me, I'm Mariam Hamadani. I'm the Associate Director of CCSRE, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you um, to today's Chautauqua. Now, before I turn it over to Leah Gordon, who's Assistant Professor of Education and also a 2015-2016 CCSRE Faculty Research Fellow, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, so first, let me tell you, if you haven't been to one of our Chautauquas before, uh, just a quick word about, about the event. So we're here today to celebrate work of our faculty fellow, Paula Moya, and also to enjoy a stimulating and open conversation of over food and over wine, um, and also some desserts as well, uh, amongst uh, colleagues and friends. And so the Chautauquas, I want to point out, are meant to be interactive, informal, and discussion-based. So please make sure uh, to say hi to your neighbors, get up and feel free to get a refill on your glass of wine or your food um, throughout the event. And definitely during the discussion portion, we want to hear your thoughts and comments. So be prepared to participate. And next, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors. Um, we have two today, and we really appreciate their generous support and also uh, for helping us spread the word. The first is the Program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and also the American Studies Program. I saw Shelly back there. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your support. And then finally, I want to point you to the flyers on the table. Uh, we have our last event of the quarter coming up this Sunday. Um, and this is part of our year-long speaker series with the Talby Center for Jewish Studies called Between Race and Religion, Contemporary American Jewish Life. And this is the last talk in the series, which will feature Robert Putnam, and he'll be on campus speaking about how religion divides and unites Americans and why it's basically good for the Jews. So provocative title. We hope to see you there. Um, and we'll be uh, at 5 p.m. in Leventhal Hall, um, and the conversation will be moderated by Jane Shaw, Dean for Religious Life. So feel free to grab a flyer. Uh, we also send around the announcement on email. Okay, so now let me turn it over to Professor Gordon, who will introduce our speaker today. Paula Moya is Professor of English and by courtesy of Iberian and Latin American cultures. Her teaching and research focuses on 20th century and early 21st century literary studies, feminist theory, critical race theory, narrative theory, American cultural studies, interdisciplinary approaches to race and ethnicity, and Chicano, Chicana, and U.S. Latina, Latino studies. She's the author of the recent The Social Imperative, Race, Close Reading, and Compen Contemporary Literary Criticism out this year, as well as Learning from Experience, Minority Identities, Multicultural Struggles from 2002. She's also co-edited three collections of original essays, Doing Race, 21 Essays for the 21st Century, Identity Politics Reconsidered, and Reclaiming Identity, Realist Theory, and the predic Predicament of Postmodernism. She's also with Hazel Marcus, the co-editor of a CCSRE series with Stanford University Press on comparative race and ethnicity studies. After coming to Stanford in 1996, Professor Moya has served in many leadership roles. She was part of the core faculty group that founded and built CCSRE. She has also served as the director of the program in Modern Thought and Literature, vice chair of the Department of English, and director of the undergraduate program at the Center for CCSRE. She was as well a founding organizer and coordinating team member of the Future of Minority Studies Research Project, an inter-institutional, interdisciplinary, and multi-generational research project that facilitated focused and productive discussions about the democratizing role of minority identity and participation in a multiracial society. In addition, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Moya has received a number of awards and fellowships, including the Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching, a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, the Outstanding Chicana Chicano Faculty Member Award, a Clayman Institute Fellowship, and a Brown Faculty Fellowship. She also writes for Arcade, the Boston Review, and other popular academic publications. Her 2012 interview of award-winning author Juno Diaz, which addressed his concern with race, his debt to the writings of women of color, and his fictional explorations of psychic and emotional decolonization generated a lot of public attention. So, join me in welcoming Professor Moya. <laughs> Our March 21st, 2014, 28-year-old Alex Nieto stopped at a park in the San Francisco Bernal Heights neighborhood to eat a burrito before heading to his job as a security guard at a nightclub. A fan of the San Francisco 49ers, 
Alex was wearing a team jacket and black pants. He also had a licensed taser, which he used for his job, holstered on his hip. While at the park, Alex came into contact with a couple of dog walkers uh, who subsequently called 911 to report a Latin male in a red jacket, black pants, with a handgun at his hip. What happened next is a matter of dispute. What is not in dispute is that within minutes of arriving, San Francisco police officers fired a total of 52 bullets, at least 15 of which struck Alex in the face, temple, shoulders, and back. At least 11 of these shots were fired from above, indicating that he was falling, or at least on the ground, when they were fired. Alex did not survive the encounter. Although the San Francisco Police Department's investigation concluded quickly that the four officers who were involved acted appropriately, and the San Francisco DA requested an independent federal investigation into the police shooting deaths of Nieto and two other men of color, Amil Perez Lopez, who was shot uh, by undercover policemen in the back, and the other of whom may have been struggling with mental health issues. It's all been since 2014. Meanwhile, the Nieto family is proceeding with a federal civil lawsuit, hearings for which began on the first of this month. Now, I bring these cases to your attention not because I intend to adjudicate them here, but because they are ongoing and local. So that is, they are happening in our community and we ought to be concerned about them. Another reason is that two of the three are Latinos, and the vulnerability of Latinos to police brutality has received less attention in the press than it deserves. And finally, because all three men have suffered posthumous demonization by the police that appears designed to paint them as criminally inclined and so responsible in some sort of perverse way for their own deaths. Now, while Mario Woods did have a criminal record, and that's something that we could talk about, but you know, we'll admit that he did, neither Nieto nor Perez Lopez did. Nieto, in fact, was a City College of San Francisco student working toward a degree in criminal justice. Because the issue, um, in any case, the point I want to make here is that focusing on these young men's background uh, distracts from the issue at hand. Because the issue at hand is whether these young men did anything in the moments leading up to their killings that in any way justified the use of lethal force. So here's the crux of the problem. From what I have read about the Nieto case, I would say, no, he probably didn't do anything that justified the use of least lethal force. But both the 911 callers and the police clearly perceived the situation differently. According to the picture painted by SFPD chief Greg Sewer, Nieto was a large, threatening man wearing gang colors who was armed and dangerous and who resisted police commands while pointing a weapon at the officers in a way that made them fear for their lives. Because of this perception, Nieto lost his life, his parents lost their son, and his friends lost someone they dearly loved. Now there is much to say about the way the case has been handled by the police following the shooting, and I encourage you to follow up on your own. I actually became aware of this case in part because of an exhibit at the Counter Art Center, a missing persons exhibit in which he was. Otherwise, I would not have no idea. But what I am most interested in today are those initial perceptions, the way in which a guy, uh, in which the way in which Nieto was transformed from a guy eating a burrito in a scenic location in a San Francisco park before heading to work to a credible threat to the civic order whose very being demanded his brutal elimination. Now the fact that the two men who called 911 are both white and likely among those who are gentrifying the area is not irrelevant to the story, even if, as one of them testified in court just the other day, they are now very sorry about the loss of Nieto's life. Now let me tell you about another incident, one that further illustrates the problem of perception. On June 19th, 2015, a 49-year-old construction worker 
and father of two named Walter de Leon, went out for his regular evening walk around the park on Los Feliz Boulevard in Los Angeles. As was his habit, he carried with him a water bottle and a towel to wipe the sweat off his brow. At some point, for some reason, he waved down two police officers who were driving by. Because he waved with the hand that had the towel wrapped around it, the officer's threat response was to demand that he drop the gun. When Walter failed to drop the gun that he didn't have, Officer Cairo Palacios ran up to him and shot him in the face. From contact to shooting took about 30 seconds. Palacios and his partner then rolled the unconscious and bloodied De Leon over on his back in order to handcuff him. Now I'm not going to show it to you, but a cell phone video of Walter De Leon being rolled over and handcuffed as he lay unconscious on the ground is on the web at thefreethoughtproject.com. Walter survived the shooting, but with severe facial and head injuries that have re rendered him unable to work, live, or even walk on his own. And as with Nieto and Perez Lopez, the officers to blame for this debacle sought to blame the victim for his injuries, claiming that he had been acting aggressively and that they had every reason to feel that they were in imminent danger. Now, why do I insist that these cases illustrate a problem of perception? Well, for those of you who are familiar with the work of Jennifer Eberhardt, I probably don't need to explain this to you. But I'll simply say that I'm, um, I insist on this for one reason, because such shootings are not anomalous. You've heard a, a lot about them, largely with regard to African-American men. My point is it's not only African-American men that are often perceived in this way. So the thing is, is they fit into a larger pattern of police interactions with communities of color. Now for another, and I want to set aside for a minute the evidently ex post facto attempts on the part of the SFPD and the LAPD to criminalize their several victims, I'm assuming that the officers involved actually perceived these men to be the threats they imagined them to be. And while some, uh, otherwise, if I didn't assume that they actually perceived this, then I would have to assume that they intentionally set out to kill black and brown men. And certainly, while there are some officers in some locales that might indeed have that intention, surely not all would. But beyond that, the simple attribution of evil to individual police officers would do nothing to help us understand the larger picture of why they might want to kill them in the first place. So these kind of incidents are only the most visible and deadly examples of the widespread and profound consequences of racial perception. And their urgency calls for what I, following Lonnie Guineer and Franz Windance Twine, conceive of as racial literacy. So as I argue in the social imperative, people do not just see race, we read it actively engaging in interpretive practices that draw upon widely available cognitive affective schemas that attribute particular meanings to specific bodies, behaviors, styles, and spaces. The consequences of the way various people read race are myriad, and while not all end in blood, the interpretive practices with which I am centrally concerned affect everything, from the kind of job a person might get, to another's likelihood of receiving an unfavorable interest rate on a mortgage loan, to a judgment about which scholars need to be listened to and which others can be ignored or dismissed as not worthy of regard. Reading race, in other words, is a central mechanism in the doing of the historically derived, institutionalized, and dynamic system of race. So now I come at this problem, of re the problem of reading race, from the standpoint of an interdisciplinary scholar of race and ethnicity who is practiced in the methods of literary criticism. So as a literary critic, I am interested in how schemas, as documented by experimental social psychologists, work in literature, as well as how schemas affect the way literature works. Readers bring to the scene of reading their own sets of schemas, and these schemas affect whether and how readers value and enjoy specific works of literature, as well as what those readers take away from the scene of reading. 
Now, because I am interested in the agency of both reader and text, I use the conceptual tool of the schema to look closely at both parties to what Leslie Larkin calls the literary encounter. Now, in doing this, I have articulate a link between several heretofore separate schools of literary criticism that have focused on either one party or the other. Reader response, or reception theory, has tended to focus on what is happening in the head of the reader, while new criticism and the more recent surface reading have tended to focus on what appears to be there in the text. Still other schools of criticism, like, say, new historicism, new historicism have tended to elide these uh, questions altogether, but without putting the specific frameworks used in any given analysis under scrutiny. So drawing on the scholarship of the Russian formalist Mikhail Bakhtin, I build on the idea of heteroglossia. So I'm doing my literary critical thing right here, and then I'll get back to it. <laughs> anyway, I build on the idea of heteroglossia to point out that not only narrative voices, but even whole worlds of sense can be contained within a given work of literature. It is the multi-perspectivalism of the kind of literature that I find most compelling that calls forth the activity of the literary critic and that demands an interrogation of the various schema at work for reader and uh, for, for reader, any given reader, and also the various schema that are embedded there into the text. By attending to the way readerly schemas both do and do not match up with the schemas that are embedded into the text through metaphors, motifs, intertextual allusions, and narrative structure itself, I illuminate the, multiplic the multiplicity and the productivity of literary meaning through careful, close readings that are as attentive to the multiple contexts from which a work emerges as to the several contexts within which it is interpreted, a good literary critic participates in the creation and the transmission of literary meaning. Now, there are at least three reasons why literature is an especially valuable medium for exploring the way race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality are materialized in human lives. And all three of these reasons are related to the kind of aesthetic object that works of literature are. And now I'm not making any kind of claim about like literature is the, the only way. I'm just saying that the kind of uh, objects that liter literary works are like conduce to, um, uh, I think, a good way of helping us to understand these issues. So apart from allowing readers to world travel, literature can also facilitate a kind of time travel. A narrative might begin generations in the past and then carry the reader up through the present and even into the future. And even when a narrative is set squarely in the past, the resulting temporal disjunction between that past and the readerly present collapses the temporalities of past and present in the scene of reading. And of course, in the case of something like speculative fiction, the narrative carries a reader into the what could be of an alternative or future social world. So the significance of the time traveling feature of literature for the study of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality reveals itself when one considers the effects of time on the development of a self, or the effects of past historical events on the shape of present day political and cultural institutions. And so for those of you who had a chance to read the Morrison chapter, you, you see this is exactly what I'm trying to get at here. And of course, such <laughs> effects can only be revealed over time, whether that time is measured by the span of a person's lifetime or by centuries of record keeping. Second, literature can powerfully engage readers' emotions in ways that have the potential to alter readerly schemas. In its actualized form, literature does not just take up space on our bedside table. Rather, it drags us down or lifts us up, altering our moods, pulling on our attention. Um, it doesn't just have the power to capture a reader's attention. It actually displaces it, moving it from here to there. In doing so, it reorients readers in new directions and enriches our schemas for interpreting both the fictional social worlds that we enter temporarily 
and the real, everyday social worlds in which we live. Now, occasionally, the work of literature changes our lives, motivating readers to the kinds of concrete actions that bring profound changes in our life possibilities. And I brought something I wanted to show you. <laughs> Finally, most literary narratives take as their customary focus the lives over time of a range of characters in a way that can provide, doesn't always, but it can provide material for readers' meditations on the complexities of social dynamics. By representing the interconnected lives of different characters that are all negotiating multiple and overlapping structures of power and privilege, a good work of literature can suggest to its readers how race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality constrain and enable characters' bodies, behaviors, and ideologies. In this way, some works of literature allow a reader to perceive and a literary critic to analyze the way race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality actually matter, both in the sense of being important and meaningful and in the sense of becoming materialized in individual mm -hmm. lives. So much of the work in the individual chapters of the social imperative is thus devoted to reading the type of text that I see as building racial literacy, even as I model in those um, chapters the method of close reading that is crucial for that same project. So racial literacy, to return to Guineer, is an interactive process in which race function, uh, functions as a tool of diagnosis, feedback and assessment, right? So it's not a thing, right? It's something that helps us to perceive the social dynamics. So rather than taking race as a given, it examines the relationship between race and power, attending always to the structural as well as the individual and interpersonal nature of race. It requires interrogating the um, <clears throat> dynamic relationship between race and other cross-cutting and intermeshing vectors of power and oppression, such as class, geography, disability, sexuality, and religion, while also working to build a moral consensus about the role of government and the role of the public in ameliorating the negative effects of inequality broadly. Now, Twine adds to my understanding of racial literacy with her insistence that it calls for specific skills, among which are the ability to interpret racial codes and racialized practices, and importantly, the development of a vocabulary with which to discuss and transmit knowledge about race and anti-racism. So all of those uh, things are part of racial literacy that I think um, Lanier and Twine, in their separate ways, bring together. So insofar as literature is a system of social communication through which information, ideas, norms are transmitted from author to reader and among different communities of readers, then literary texts have the potential to alter our perceptions and teach us how to interpret unfamiliar phenomena. They shape our cultural imaginaries, and they build for us schemas through which we interpret the social world. For these reasons, it matters not only which specific literary texts we choose to teach, but also how we teach them and to whom. So this is why I have been drawn to works of literature that seek to challenge our country's dominant racial schemas. So I approach the authors whose writings I focus on in the book as astute cultural critics whose essayistic and fictional works are extended and theoretically sophisticated mediations, meditations on and inquiries into race and ethnicity as systems of social distinction. And I never really thought about doing this until I went and gave a talk at um, uh, in Portland and uh, the University of Oregon, and somebody asked me, "How are you? How are you? In, how are you treating your authors?" And I was confused. And then I realized, like, oh, well, for me, these people are people who are working through a problem, and I, I'm accepting the invitation to work through the problem with them. It's one of the reasons why I don't tend to work on uh, literature that I don't think highly of the author. It's, uh, <laughs> it's so anyway. Toni Morrison, <laughs> Lorna D. Cervantes, 
Elena Maria Viramontes, Manuel Munoz, Juno Diaz, and Audrey Lord all thematize the way people read race onto the bodies of others. But they do more than this, going well beyond mere investigation and illustration. They also employ all the narrative resources available to them to resist the stigmatized meanings their bodies, cultures, and values have been made to bear through the use of metaphors, motifs, and intertextual allusions, and via transformations in narrative form, they facilitate the development of alternative racial schemas that have a more referentially accurate relationship to the social world than those that circulate broadly in public discourse. Through their writings, these authors work to create racial literacy. Now, literature by itself will never change the world or create racial literacy, but it nevertheless remains a powerful tool, an important actor in the ongoing struggle to create another way to be human and free. And this is the social imperative of literature. <laughs>